Now here on to a special program in which Benedict Kiley talks to the late Pather O'Donnell, author and revolutionary who died yesterday. They say those whom the gods love die young. And that was certainly true of Pather O'Donnell who died yesterday at the age of 93. A man who, through a long, busy, fruitful, adventurous life, preserved the energy and wonder and some of the anger of a young man. Born near Dunglow in County Donegal, he knew at first hand the hard life of the small farm and the tatey hokers who migrated seasonally to maintain their grip on the land. Trained as a teacher with the deep instinct of a great humanitarian, he quickly moved into organising, writing, campaigning, fighting for better conditions for workers. Pather O'Donnell, like some others of his generation, married that social concern and passion for justice with an active part in the struggle for independence. It drove him into, and indeed out of, the IRA, provoked him to a great campaign against the land annuitors. Beyond direct action, he was a great polemicist and a productive and compelling man of letters. Beside enduring novels, islands, Ardragool, The Big Window, and his autobiographical books, Pather O'Donnell will be remembered among the writers who struck the bell for freedom in an Ireland constrained by moral and legal censorship. Three years ago, another Ulsterman, like himself a man of letters and life, Ben Kiley spoke to Pather O'Donnell about his life and work. Uh, I think I possibly would, have, would never have written if I hadn't been in solitary confinement for a considerable time in an in, in camp. And I found my mind slipping out the window to boats and islands and things I liked. An island has practically wrote itself on my mind. You, you were always extremely, I suppose every writer to some extent condemns himself to solitary confinement, but you were always, you were always fascinated by the shape and make of the island and by the shape and make of the town land. Like you said, if there isn't peace in the town land, it's going to get nowhere. Well, that's true. And and you know, you could always tell a town, whether a town land was a happy place or not by whether the dogs barked a lot. Yes. If the people weren't friendly, the dogs kept up very incessant barking. Is that so? Mm. A hostile barking? Yeah. Being the mad, the Atafan, they used to say, in, in, in the, the, along the coast. That is interesting. Mm. And that runs, I think, all through your books, the necessity for social cohesion mm. and the, the growing together of either island or townland, even in, in uh, what I think is, is the, the two of your greatest novels to me, I suppose, would be Adragul and The Big Windows. I don't know if you'd agree with that yourself. Well, The Big Windows, yes. You see, um, with me, um, there's always some experience in the circumstances around it that uh, sort of imprinted itself on my memory. and. I called it up and wrote out of, wrote out of it. And at the Google, I was in Mountjoy Jail, and I read in the morning paper about this family dying down on the Cork Kerry border. And since I had never been to the Cork Kerry border, I set the story in Donegal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made the people very vital. In fact, I always think that they, it wasn't this, the environment that crushed the people. I think I killed them. For the sake of the... And to make, the, make it end the way, the way, the way that I yeah. put it into the headline. Well, there's an extraordinary thing about it that when you begin that novel, the inspector comes to the school mm. and the children are all in their best behaviour. One mm. little fellow with a raggedy coat, but he has good corduroys. Mm. And his great talent is to add nine to everything. He's mm. infallible at that. He can... Mm. Uh, nine plus nine, and mm -hmm. he can do it all the time, mm -hmm. but he can't do anything else. And then there's the really bright boy. And the picture of the children is so intimate and moving. And then the end of the thing, the perishing of the family is so terribly tragic. I felt that you had worked it out from, you know, the sort of idyllic happiness in the beginning to this terrible tragedy at the end. The contrast was, was mm -hmm. fearful. Yeah. Well, um, the, the extraordinary thing is I just had the mountainy town area in my mind and uh, sort of worked it out in, in terms of that environment yes. and I don't think I had any very conscious pl 
plan beyond just the, uh, the environment and these people. The local doctor in Adragul on the Kirkcaldy border told me that the local people down there identified everybody in the book, though I'd never been in that area. That, 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 that's extraordinary, but in a way not surprising, as it was the pattern of life in the yeah. Kerry Mountains didn't, wouldn't really have differed When that I much. wrote Islanders, a, a woman tramped four miles to borrow my mother's copy of the book, and having read it, she tramped four miles back to return it. And then she said to my mother, wouldn't you be a bit ashamed that father put his name to a book like that? My mother was a bit taken aback. I said, no, well, I don't know. Oh, for God's sake, Biddy, she said, either you or I could have written that book. You see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, mind you, that, that, and that was a marvellous tribute, at least, that you had got the people as they were. Mm -hmm. I told you that story about the blind man that I met in America, mm -hmm. Patrick Morrissey, he was. He was a l linguist even though he was blind, but he addressed me in Irish, which he had learned from his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And in conversation, he revealed this fierce sentiment now, knowledge of the coast of Donegal. He had never been in Ireland, and he was stone blind from birth. But he had learned Donegal from uh, a Braille edition of, I assume it was, I was it I Islanders? Islanders, yes. yes. He knew it by heart, practically, mm -hmm. from... Then I was remember Braille asking me to give permission to translate Islanders, and I... I said that anything I wrote, they didn't have to ask permission. They could use it as a system. Yes. Well, they certainly used Islanders. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you were concentrating. You had a different name for the American edition of Islanders. Yeah, they. No, I wasn't. I. I didn't um, have anything to do with the making of yes. the name. No, it, it's not. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was a, a marketing reason they changed the name, but the name indicated did indicate in a way your interest in the social condition of the people. It was that uh, and your knowledge of the people and the hardship of their lives that drove you into the labour movement and then ultimately into... Well, Glasgow really was the first step yes. to my driving into the labour movement. I went over there to see the conditions of the workers in the potato fields and I had been a member of the Delhi Trades Council so I naturally looked up the Glasgow Trades Council to see whether they could help and the chairman of the Glasgow Trades Council was a black-haired little firebrand named Manny Shinwell. Mm -hmm. It's pretty oh, hard. Yes. Pretty hard to recognise Lord Shinwell yeah. today. And um, they opened up to me the wonderful, exciting world of working-class struggle. And uh, when I came back to Dublin, I wrote to Liberty Hall and asked them to give me a job as organiser. Took me on. And I was absolutely appalled at my own ignorance when I got to Liberty Hall. How so was that? Because I didn't know anything about the theory of uh, structure of society, and I read everything and went to lectures and so on. But it took me quite a while to get it. And the best piece of advice I got during that mm. period came from a plumber in Ballina and said to me, no matter how well versed you are in the theory of social revolution, you've got to learn how to talk to people in terms of their own experiences. That was very good. Mm. Well, well, at that time, was it that, that time that you encountered McGill? No, I encountered McGill later on in, in London um, with Con O'Leary mm -hmm. in the Poor Provinces Club. Of course, I knew all about his work and was a great admirer of his. Yes. And I met him with some awe. Well, he had gone out as a labouring boy. He worked around Rum Quinn there near Oman yeah. in Tyrone. Oh, he had a very hard life. Yes. And he served in the war. He was in the I, I, I think his description of the death of the Navy, as the bullock fall in the crooked ruts, he fell when the day was over. The hunger grip in his stinted guts, his body shaken and sore. They pulled it out of the ditch in the dark as the brute just pulled from his lair the corpse of the navvy, stiff and stark, with clay on his face and hair. Arrogant adipose you sit, and the houses he builded high, dirty the ditch in the depth of it, he chooses a spot to die. Foamed with nicotine tainted lips, swearing as sinners swear, raving the rhyme with a gambling screw and mixing it up with a prayer. 
Oh. The, the poems were good, mind you. Well, they were very authentic. They were authentic, they were real. That's everything mm. he wrote was. That's he, right. they, they well, the thing, I think he only wrote really two novels that were quite directly at his experiences Children of the Dead, the End, and the Rat Pit. Yes. I uh, like the comic novel, Lanty Hanlon, well, in yes. later uh, moment. It was readable. But it was the. Um, mm. he, did, he did make an impression, though. The. Um, now, when did your, um, you might say, socialistic activity, I don't use it exactly in that sense, of well, it'll I bring you first... Well, I don't know. Um, I'm, my mother was pretty radical, and there must have been some sort of a lingering radicalism in the, in the family, because her two brothers in America joined the IWW. Mm -hmm. oh, the climate of the house was kind of radical. Yes. Father, uh, Talking about the hard road to Scotland from Donegal, uh, which you followed to find out really what went on, I remember the last of the hiring fairs myself in my own native town. They lasted longer in Straban and I think and sometimes further to the south. But you followed the, the long hard trail to Scotland through well, the hiring fairs. They, they, um, not through the hiring fairs, I didn't know much about the hiring yeah. fairs, but there was no compulsory school attendance. Yes. And uh, children up to 12 years, down, down to 12 years of age, yes. went to the Tatty Fields. And I went across, and uh, Dora, the Defence of the Realm Act, was in vogue at the time, and mm -hmm. you had to, you couldn't, you couldn't enter into the food production thing in any agitational shape. And I went down and got work. And um, I stayed there uh, through wheat and our and, uh, 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 and, uh, and air share. Slept in barns and, 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 and barns and byres, and sleeping on, on straw. And you know, I was often amused at um, um, people coming in and making headlines of the fact that people slept on straw. But they were far too wise to sleep on anything else. Yes. Because after all, they would spend three or four weeks on a particular farm. And if there were mattresses stored mm -hmm. and they were then produced, it would be damp. And, and you are much better off on good clean yes. straw. Well, the the, um, the the conditions of life must have been damnably hard. The work in the were very hard. Yes, yeah. were very hard. And then you were much involved in in exposition and agitation about the famous Bothy fire or infamous. Well, I kn I knew um, I was in Kirkintilla. I never slept in it, but I had tea in it, and it wasn't the worst of the Bothys by any manner of means. They the um, Bothies were worst in Ayrshire and Str and Winkenshire, and, and the conditions were improved there, but mainly by a man called Joe Duncan. All I mm -hmm. really contributed was that I got to know the officials who could help, yes. and they were very willing to help. And that's really Joe Duncan was a very useful person. Mm -hmm. He was the secretary of the Scottish Farm Seven Union. He made quite an improvement. The Kirkintilla, I remember the, the Kirkintilla place, I remember noticing the, how high the windows were. And uh, I could understand that they couldn't burst out yes. through the windows afterwards. Well, was it right that they locked the, the, the huts, you know, the one for men? The one gaffer for locked the huts, and he yes. wasn't sleeping in the hut. Yes. And he shouldn't have locked the door. Yes. And... Well, there was always the danger with that, I suppose. Yeah, and there, there was some trouble in getting the key. Yes. To open it. Why mm. the, the high windows in the bathroom? I don't know. That was just whatever it was. Yes. Mm. It wasn't really built as a bathy for, for workers. It was built for something else. And the windows were very high up on the wall. Yes. And small. Yes. It's a song about the broomy law, the titty hookers. Yeah, hi ho the tatty hookers, hi ho the big and small. Hi ho, the tatty hokers marching by the Brummelaw. Used to be jeered at. Yes. Yeah, the most barefooted and tatters. Of course, the truth of the matter is that the average Scottish worker looked on the potato digger uh, workers pretty much the way uh, we look on itinerants. Yes. They didn't take them. They didn't give them any particular status, but the people preserved their own dignity and looked after themselves well. Yes. Of course, there was a long history behind that, I suppose, of 
the Spalpeen worker in Britain generally, you know, it goes back well, to Charlton. Well, yeah, see, there were two kinds of emigration to Scotland. If a man were going over by himself, he never went to the tatties. Mm -hmm. He went among the farmers. But if a man uh, with a group of, of his family were going over, they went to the tatty field and they pulled their earnings mm -hmm. and they did better that way. The main uh, source of of recruitment for um, for the farmers for for the tatties was iron more and ackle, yes. part of Mayo, boarding ackle. And they saved up their some of them saved up their Scottish money then to make the big jump to Boston. Well, the uh, practice in when I was a, a lad in my part of the country was that a fellow went to Glasgow, Scotland to earn his money to go to uh, earn his fare to Boston. And if he wasn't out of Scotland into Boston at the end of the second year, the family were very disturbed. Yes. And I often heard it said, ah, poor Johnny never got beyond Scotland. Yes. It meant that he was, if he wasn't out by the end of the second year, he was drinking or gambling. Of course, the money was, mm. the money was going. It was like the second stage in his education. Yeah. Right? He would get his degree then in Boston. Yeah, that's that's very noticeable in the big windows because you might say the other half of the Glen, they're all over in Boston. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lovely bit in that where the conversation is going on between two men and one says he saw more wonders in Carrick on a fair day than he ever saw in Boston. <laughs> and then yeah. the other man says you never saw a black man in Carrick. Mm. And it turns out then the poor man that went to Boston that saw nothing in Boston was never out of the house or something like mm. that. He was, yeah. yeah. And it's amazing how little change and took place in, in groups of Irish men in, Scot in America. Now, I knew a group of men in Bayonne, and they took the trolley or the car, seat car to their work, came back, washed, went down to a pub owned by an Irishman, adjourned from that to play cars in an Irish house, mm -hmm. came back. It wasn't a stick of furniture changed in their mind over the 30 odd years that they'd been in Boston. They, they clung together as a clung national. Together, I suppose yeah. the other uh, national units did that too. I'm sure they Greeks, did. Greeks, yeah. Anatolians, sure everything. Yeah. Well, there's a, a natural tendency to cling together and to keep their racial distinctness. I dare say that is going nowadays with the, There's a sort of loosening up in society, ah, yes, I suspect. Is, yes. Although the Irish yes. in Britain, in London especially, they're being held together by these functions, county. It's pretty deliberate, you know, mm -hmm. these county organizations. Yes. It's very largely young priests are doing it in order to preserve the Catholic aspects of the Irish and Britain and American mm -hmm. Britain. Is, it a, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or should well, people to my mind, it's bad. Yes. I think they should. If they're living in that environment, they should correspond with it. And become part of the new yeah, society. Yeah, they can yes. grow if they no. I mean. Because now the religion is to an Ireland that's long ago gone. They, yes. they, have, they have no knowledge of what's really the change in Ireland. And they're out of touch with the changes in their own country. But that's improving. Yes. There are a lot of uh, great activists uh, in the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. That question of the school leaving age, the young master in, is it in storm? I think is already agitating for the about the school leaving age. Were you involved in that yourself? Funny it was, yes. and when I was in Arn Moor, um, I was agitating or the raising of the school. And although it would affect the people, they were supported very much. I first got into trouble with clergy by going to the Donegal County Council to ask for free school requisites. Yes. Um, and I was accused of saying that I've got out of the schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as a man in our moor said, God must be a queer orphan. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And of course, the, 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 the conditions under which people went to the little schools were pretty grim too. You know, yes, and the, the getting money for the school books was generally a bit of a burden on the teacher. Yes. Because very often the children couldn't afford to get their books and you had to give them out. Yes. But. Father, you just said that, that what you had written came out of your, all out of your direct experience, and you mentioned a very interesting thing about a later work of yours, Proud Island, and why yeah. you wrote it. Yeah. 
this man you met. Mm. I would like to hear that again. Well, I met him in, in yes. Glasgow, yeah. and he just told me that he had come back from visiting at home, and he was so disturbed that this very nice house had um, now surplices on the gable and the roof fallen in. Mm -hmm. He was just sorry that he couldn't have the memory of it as it was. Yes. He was sorry he hadn't but a torch to it. Well, when you went through the Civil War and the prison experiences and all that to face into what was really the making of a new Ireland, it seemed at the time... Um, well, you see, my, um, to me, the new Ireland is not based on the on the victory of the independence movement, but on its defeat. Yes, yes. And um, that's interesting. The um, the interests that 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 wrecked the independence movement, when Arthur Griffith signed the treaty at at uh, at um, quarter past two in the morning of the sixth of December, and at eleven o'clock, he met the Southern Unionists, um, the rep their representatives. Lord Middleton, Jemison, and the Provost of Trinity College to assure them that their property would be undisturbed, and that they would be properly re represented in the Dáil, and that he would consult them on the formation of the of the Senate, so that you you were really making a change of management, but no change in the in the structure on which it re all rested. Mm -hmm. You, know, the, 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 you were settling back and actually into the same rut, the Absolutely, same people yeah, yeah. possessed and controlled the property. Yeah. You see, most of the revolutions of, of history have been just simply changes of management. Yes. They haven't been any change. I suppose even the French Revolution was to some extent. Well, the French Revolution, the French Revolution um, burst through medieval rubbish I mean, when Marx was doing his his work, he he he, he based himself on three um, things: the classical Fra uh, German philosophy, French socialism, and English political economy. Mm -hmm. Ricardo and Smith, and he developed on from there. But the um, the Civil War period. The IRA, we formed, the IRA formed an executive of 16, 1922. I think I'm the only one of the 16 left alive. But my God, we were a feckless um, um, group. And I say, and I think I've been writing about it, that the um, leadership of the anti-treaty forces was confused, um, uninspired, and feckless. Mm -hmm. I think it was very poor. Well, I, I suppose it was extremely difficult for young men who had merely been pitched into two or, you might say, two or three years of yeah. disturbance. Well, I hold that yeah. the great weakness in the development of the independence movement took place in 1918. Yes. The, um, um, if James Connolly had been alive, the, the, the labor movement would have demanded a quota of seats and would have got them very willingly from Sinn Féin, and you'd have had a vanguard of, uh, of workers and clearly in view in the um, leadership of the independence movement. And I saw Sinn Féin rise from the steps of Liberty Hall, and everybody really around Liberty Hall said, Arthur Griffith will duck out on the level of home rule. Mm -hmm. And when he does, the working class will move forward rally the confused workers and small farmers and press on for complete independence. But uh, in 1918, when the ele election was taking place, the trade union movement didn't put forward any candidates. And poor Deb made a, a, made a, a statement that when they wanted Shin, um, Labour to stand aside and leave them a free field in 1918, that they did so. Well, that was leadership on stilts. He just didn't know that what really had happened was that the, the, the officials of the trade union movement were scared of their lives, that if they, they identified themselves directly with the independence movement, that there would be some de de defection among the membership of the branches. 
and it, it was a God saying to them that um, that um, Griffith and De Valera said labor must wait. It concealed their weakness, hid it. Yes. But they certainly failed Connolly in 1918. Really? And uh, I just wonder whether it would have made a lot of difference if they had moved forward, and if they had moved forward, whether the Labour Party would still be on stilts, on crutches, as it is today. Yes. That you, you think the actual decay of the Labour Party began in like 1918. just at that, yeah, at that yeah, moment? Yeah. And yes. one of the reasons why Labour was so slow to get any, any kind of grip in Dublin was that the Dublin workers were Republican, Yes. And they saw in Fianna Fáil something more Republican than they saw in the Labour Party. They associated the Labour Party with Fine Gael. Yes. Or even perhaps with Britain. Would that have been possible? With what? With Britain. No, no, no with Fine With Fine Gael. No, yeah. That's rather extraordinary. Mm. Well, you see, they, they were very... If, if Labour had... Um, kept out of the free state parliament, it would have been, you see, you put a kite in the air, and unless there's a tail to the kite, it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't float, it won't mm. keep up. Yes. And they formed the tail to the Fine Gael kite in 1922. Is it possible that, you know, when, when you said we have fed the heart on fantasies, the heart has grown brutal and affair, that there's something in the Irish disposition that rather goes for theories and fantasies than for actual hard but reality. Funny enough, I don't think there's much difference between us and most people. Yes. I was for a period chairman of the European Small Farmer Committee movement, and I sat with groups of small farmers in various countries throughout the Balkans, up into Polish Ukraine, and I got the impression that the workers, the small farmers I sat with in the various countries, were more like one another than any of them was like the industrial workers of his own country. Yes. The way you make the way a community makes its living conditions the content of its mind and really yes. is. Well your own life I suppose uh, from there on in we'll say um, uh, roughly about nineteen thirty would have centered in and around Dublin, but you you were in contact with international movements I was, all the yes, time. All the and time. with what was going on around yeah. you in the country yeah. and with the whole question of the land annuities about which you wrote, and the whole welfare of rural Ireland. You see, I, I was editor of an public, which was really owned yes. by the IRA, yes, and I used it shamelessly, as though it was a private organ that I yes. could re use for my land annuity campaign. I'm quite certain there were groups of, of the Army Council that met to discuss how they could control, but it never got as far as the agenda of the, of the um, Army Council. Yes. I just now it's whack away. Was that your first experience of editing with, on public? Yeah. Yes. I knew nothing about newspaper work. Yes. And um, first day I went into Cahill's, the printers, to produce an public. I was so scared as how much went, I knew so little about how much went mm -hmm. into a paper that I actually set up makings of two and a quarter papers. <laughs> well, poor, poor, <laughs> um, but you know, who could curse very, free, very freely, yes. was so taken <laughs> aback that he all he could do was throw, throw up his two hands. Yeah, I suppose it was better to have too mm. much than too little anyway. Mm. Well, later on, you, you were responsible for the, the setting up, to a great extent, of the bell later well, on. Well, Sean O'Fallon yes, was created. The, I got from Joe McGrath the money that it was founded on, but it was, it was um, O'Fallon on. O that gave it its stature. Yeah. And I really... <coughs> should have ended the bell when O'Fallon ceased to edit it. Because well, why do you think that? Because I hadn't, I couldn't keep it up to the sort of standard that oh, that O'Fallon had. Mm -hmm. If I had been creating it, <coughs> it would have been more a magazine of life than of letters. Yes. There again is the, the, the conflict in you between the the, the novelist and the the social Sociology, reformer. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yes. The O'Brien Press did, did Proud Island for you, which is um, yeah. contains both a good dust cover note and, and a good um, bibliography, not complete. Mm. But um, they've also done recently a very handsome reprint of The Big Windows. Mm. Um, 
That to me is, is the most extraordinary book. Um, well, interestingly enough, um, I had been a night on this glen, and going off next morning, I was looking back into the glen, there were six or seven houses in it, and, uh, and I said to the local man, who is she, that young woman? And he said, I don't know much about her, she's from one of the islands. And it was almost as though you struck a match in my mind. As I asked it, I was noticing the unusually big windows in this house. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine that a girl coming from an island, and an island is very full of light with the sea around it and the sky over it. She goes into a glen where the, where the mountains are like a half door to the sky, mm -hmm. and the windows are like spectacles. And she would do nothing about the mountains, but she could do something about the windows. And I thought that was why the big windows were there. I don't know whether there was a word of reality about that. I, I would, <coughs> a friend of mine once walking in a mountain place like that met a woman who said to him, do you like mountains? And he said, I do. And she said, I hate mountains. It was over in the west. And you have the thing in Sing, the shadow of the glen that I suppose oppressed mm. the woman. She I wanted know. the big windows for the light. Aye. But yeah. the, 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 the legends, was there any glen that you had in your mind specifically? You oh, say yes. the town oh, of yes. Carrick. Do you mean actual Carrick as it is? Or was it no, just, no Carrick. It wasn't, not yeah. that Carrick. I know. You see, you, 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 you have a vision of an environment, and if you want to run a team through it, you call up people out of that environment, know, yes. out of the earth, to live out your team. Yes. And if they're authentic as against the environment, yes. that's all the authenticity you need. Yeah. Well, you'll make your own locality, as Hardy did, so you take mm. a bit and you move yeah. them around. Or as you move the locality in Andragul from Kerry up to the Donegal background. That's right, yeah. Yes. But uh, the, 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 the way the story is finally turned, a thing, in case anybody would be listening that hadn't read it, that I wouldn't mention because mm. it's so good, and there's a sort of intimacy about the end of it that when you come to it, uh, the reader almost feels that he's reading a sort of family history. That folklore. You been, folklore that you've been listening to mm. for thousands of years. Yeah. And, you know, the, the column kill prophecy, that's mm. an extraordinary thing, and the mm. legends about it in the Glen, yeah. and that the Glen woman tells it to the child, yeah. but only a Glen woman can do it. But did, was that actually a living tradition? Well, I must you have... elaborated it? I must have yeah. met it, you know, and you elaborated it. And the, the question of, of turning over the four uh, sods in the four corners of, yes. the, of the site, yes, I remember that, that goes back a long way. There was a time when nobody knew who owned land. Yes. And if a man intended to build a house, he gave an indication of what he had in mind by turning up the sods from yes. the four corners. And if anybody questioned his right to build, they would turn the sods back. Yes. And people had forgotten what the origin of it was. Yes. And they put it down to fish rugs and then. The good people mm. would turn back the yeah. sod. Yeah. I like the lovely turning at the end where you never really see where the woman went afterwards. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of dying fall where the poor husband is killed in a trivial fashion. Mm -hmm. You see that there the story should have ended, but People talk to her and talk to her yeah. and give you the impression that somebody came by, yeah. heard the story and wrote it down. Yeah. It gets all the quality of legend there marvelously mm. in that. Well, Father, you more or less once hinted to me that you would have regarded writing as something secondary in your life, to put it that way. Mm. Uh, could, you, could you explicate a bit on that? Well, there was always some provocation that made me write. Um, Islanders was written, as I tell you, as a, an escape from the aridity of the of the of the cell, and uh, the other things were always something that made me uh, made me do it, made me write, and I, I I really used my pen as a kind of a weapon, and can any kind of a reputation that I made as a writer was um, a kind of defense mechanism for the attacks on me. Yeah. You had, in fact, you had something to say, but uh, I would look at it in this way, that you've written in novel form some perfect stories. Now, with that, you, you came from a part of Donegal where the storytelling tradition is well, in the veins of the people. Well, a thing like the big, like the big windows, yeah. that, that, was, that was really Ackle. Yes. And um, the, the, the procession and so on. Um, of all the attempts to drive me out of the island. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it immensely. Yes. And the interesting thing was, I always enjoyed a hostile meeting. For some reason or another, 
enjoy the challenge of a hostile meet. Yes. There was the famous, the, the famous one on College Green. Yes, I was nearly lynched in College Green, <laughs> and I had, I had nothing to do with it, I don't think. <laughs> uh, Willie Goddard came over, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Collier had spent the, 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 the month's um, retreat yes. um, uh, on, on communism, and he had inflamed the animal gang to such a degree. <laughs> and I went down to the meeting because I knew Willie Geller and liked him. Mm -hmm. And the group around him were standing in against the Bank of Ireland, no platform, no anything, big crowd. And I, I thought, this is ridiculous. And I shinned up a lamppost to say, a bit of sense, Willie Geller's right to be heard in Ireland. Yeah. Only to discover that I was a much more popular target <laughs> and I always remember the big, you remember the large lens in Alec Newman's spectacles? Yes. I could see him away in the distance and Alec moving away from the thing at the end of the meeting said, for the first time in my life mm. I understand why he said, I know not the man. <laughs> <laughs> of course getting up the up the lamp post, you rather made yourself a, a target. Course. And I hadn't, the, I, had the, I hadn't the moral courage to come down. Yes. <laughs> and I was delighted when the police pulled me down, but I didn't pretend to be. <laughs> then they took me along to Peter Street barracks. And <coughs> when the crowd dispersed, I went home. And I found Willie Galler and John Murray uh, with a tray mm. in front of a blazing fire, mm. having something to eat, and I'd been dying for them down the town. Yes. Seamus O'Grain, I had a good story once that I heard him telling in your presence about the two of you in Derry one night when there was shooting going on down yeah. the street and you were, you, you were in bed and you leapt out and immediately got into your clothes and Seamus said, why are you in such a hurry? And you said, I have my pyjamas with me and I don't want to play Robert Emmett in a short shirt <laughs> in the Derry Diamonds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seamus <laughs> and I were great friends. He was a droll man. He was, really. You could yeah. very easily get martyred up a lamppost like that, you know. Mm. So well, you didn't think of it that way, but there was a mm, thing that struck me, stuck in the lapel of my, of my top coat, a weapon that I didn't, had never seen before in Dublin, a potato with Gillette razor, split, or oh. Gillette razor blade stuck in it. That it was, was very nasty. Napa, so I never, heard of that. Particularly nasty, sort of. I'd never, I'd never heard of it being used in Dublin before. Nor since, I hope. Mm, I mean, that's that's a nasty one. Mm. A new use for the Irish potato. Mm? A yeah, new yeah. use for the Irish yeah, potato. Yeah. And for the Gillette bread. <laughs> Used. Mm -hmm. Well. And you know, yeah. with me, life had been one big long day. I couldn't slice it off into years. I just don't remember what date anything more took mm. place on. How do you look back on your life, Patty? Well, you know, my, the old theory that when well, you have free will, you're free to do or not to do. But I think, taking all the circumstances into effect, that you're not free not to do. And I think that the circumstances are being repeated. I would behave as I behaved. I don't think there's any escape.